So um, going with the whole engorge thing, the head transitioning from normal to uh, having this, what do you call the deacon peak? We, well, me in this particular case, just started to explore using those morph targets and an animation. And the purpose of the animation was not to show that this is what it would look like happening to the character, but rather Ridley pick a moment on the timeline that you think is appropriate. That too far? And I could just go with the slider and move it back and forth and we can pick what seems to be an appropriate um, level of infection. And then from there, super simple way of doing it because oftentimes there's not the time to take it into Moto, properly texture it. I would just do layer passes, which is a common way now, in ZBrush and bring them into um, Photoshop and spice it up a touch. So that was where this particular character was heading. Um, I wasn't loving it. It was fun to do. And when I brought it into Ridley and showed him these, he was again impressed with the technology, but not the design. Even though, which is great about Ridley, he will look at it and go, I sent you down the wrong path. I just wasted so much of your time. I'm really sorry, Neville. That's how Ridley is. It's unbelievable. He would apologize and say, no, I, I've sent you down the wrong path, so let's not do this. This is too much like a goblin, too much like a zombie. This is not, this is not Prometheus. And Prometheus is not alien, if you've read that. Prometheus is alien. Uh, so, we bailed on this, but the one thing I wanted to point out was part of the problem was identifying with when we see this creature, we know that it once was Fifield. So it's grown to such a height and it's torn off its spacesuit, et cetera, that we're left basically with nothing. And it made no sense to have like an earring or a gold tooth would be kind of silly. So I thought, what if he had a tattoo and that just kind of stretched with his skin? So I just grabbed some random tattoo off the internet, threw it on there, and he liked the concept. And then from there, somebody else in London developed the tattoo that he currently has so that we could see what Fifield would look like um, as a creature, identifiable primarily through just the tattoo. So here you can tell that I'm trying to reconcile that notion of how are we gonna get the jaw to come out of the head? Does that even work physiologically? Can we have the premaxilla and the mandible detach somehow? And mm, whatever, we'll just make it work. It's sci-fi, it's magic. So this, even though this is not Fifield, this is kind of where the direction is going for the first infected. So we use some of those ideas of the veins and gorging, et cetera, et cetera. And those became some of the studies, but we still have to deal with Fifield in getting his aesthetic. I'm gonna bypass these because you kind of seen it already. So again, we realized rather quickly that this is a zombie film uh, as opposed to Prometheus and it just was not working. But that is part of what we do as designers, is we do the wrong thing. Uh, and it might sound like an uh, absurd um, scenario, but 90% of the work that we do in these films is the wrong direction. So Ridley felt about this in this way. That's pretty much <laughs> how this was going. So we ended up going with Fifield falling face first into the acid mud. It burns through his mask, and we gotta come up with a way to convey that idea. Because everything has to be designed, the exact type of hole. So it really has an idea for what that hole would be, and I want to embrace that. The sketch doesn't really work out with the, the, the actual size of the helmet that's been built and the, the size of the head that's in, inside of it. So I had to kind of make sense of that. And this was all done in ZBrush as a sculpt, but then brought into Modo to do the rendering. We had an idea of his head swelling inside of the helmet and it's pushing against the glass, but it started to feel like a 50s sci-fi, we found a man on the moon. Um, it just was not working for me in particular, but it was a fun experiment. The engineer was a really bizarre one because this is what Ridley asked, I swear to God, he said, the engineer to me is basically a cross between like the Statue of Liberty mixed with the, the scale and the elegance and the, the prowess of the David mixed with Elvis Presley. <laughs> I remember when he said that to me, I thought, yeah, okay, seriously. So what's the engineer? He said, yeah, that's pretty much it. I, all right, I'll come back tomorrow with the design. 
And it confused me because I just didn't understand what he was getting at until I started to look at pictures of Elvis, the Statue of Liberty, and the David sculpt. And I realized there was this particular Roman nose feature, size of the lips, there was this proportion. So the way that made sense for me to present that to Ridley was to actually do the sculpt in the context of what he was constantly referencing, which was the Statue of Liberty. So the beginnings of the design all occurred with the Statue of Liberty as a base. Because if I took the Statue of Liberty away, he would not have that context. And it could be, well, what's this head I'm looking at? It's just a head. And it really helped to guide him as to the potential of what our character should look like. So really, what I'm doing is just sculpting a guy. And it's subjective. How muscular should he be? How tall should he be? What's his inseam? How broad are his shoulders? All these subjective things of creating the perfect male specimen. And in the end, what we kind of arrived at was, for me and Ridley, we referenced some very specific sculpts in Florence, in um, some outside gardens that had this almost mathematical, you could do it with calipers, measure the specific proportion of abs to obliques to pecs. It's a classic sculpt. So I ended up with this particular design as that sculpt. And now we're having to dress him so that he is appropriately adorned when he's on the derelict spacecraft. And this was a tough one because he talked about uh, kind of Gandhi loose um, draped clothing that was very primal in a way and it, it quickly got away from me and started to turn into some like parade you'd see in the Castro at Halloween. And I thought that's probably not what he's thinking of. Especially here, you know, baby Huey in his diaper. That's, I mean, all of these were just tragic. And it's partially because it did, I, I wasn't able to make sense of what he was asking me to do. And I was so concerned that we were not doing the right thing aesthetically for the film. And it was the one time where I said to Ridley, do you mind if I try something? I presented all these to him and he's like, mm, yeah, that's closer. I said, well, let me do one thing. And that is the engineer is waking up on the Giger ship. That aesthetic, we cannot change. If he's there, it would make sense that his G-suit, his undersuit, probably has some of that aesthetic in it. So do you mind if I just take a stab at it and get my Giger back on? And he's like, yeah, yeah, show me what you got. So I came in the next day with two versions. This one, just tone differences, and this one. And he immediately lit up and just stopped me and said, that's it. You're done. And I thought I was fired. <laughs> That's it, you're done. <laughs> it's like, I know, I suck, I'm sorry, man. And he said, no, 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 that, that is the design. We're done, you don't even need to do anything else, which really was um, a bummer because I wanted to resolve and refine and finish. But at the same time, when you see a close-up image of this, it's kind of funny. This here, Ridley pointed at this texture. He says, that is amazing, the, the detail of this ropey, texture that you got there. And I immediately thought, I don't want to touch this model ever again because that's lack of polygons that caused that. That is not intentional. So if I go, go in and I'm going to start to refine that, I have to figure out a way how to do ropes. I was like, oh, it's cool. Let's send it to London. I agree. I'm done. Moving on. Uh, and the, the crew that did the costume in London, unbelievable. Still one of the finest, finest um, transitions from concept to end result, retaining what the client loved and making it better. It was amazing. Uh, this is an unfinished shot of the engineer. There was a lot of digital cleanup in the silicone makeup. You all saw Prometheus? Okay. Good. The Trog. I'm off the project because I actually was done. And about a month later, Ridley called me up and said, hey, we have this thing called the troglodyte, troglobite, trilobite. It gave me all sorts of names. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. And um, it's kind of our octopus creature at the end of the film. I said, yeah, I remember that in the script. It was a bizarre thing. I'm in my car. I get this call. It's an emergency. We need to design right away. So I did these sketches at Starbucks. And, and I go back into my car. And I take pictures of them with my cell phone. And I send them to him via text to London which is where he was, okay, pick a design, hopefully there's one there. And 
He explained that he wanted to be octopus-like, so we had some inspiration for our materials. I think it's fun to just mess with a client sometimes. Oh, you mean like this? Oh, yeah, I guess. And real quick, this was the end result. There was very little time between the sketch and the final model. Um, there were nuances in the surfacing that was being refined with regards to the mouth. But this was that moment where I thought, okay, this is the end scene. This is the creature that fights the engineer. This is where Giger would be throwing everything he has at it. And I, I counted, I've forgotten the count, but I think I've got like 17 vulva and like 12 penises or something in this. I'm proud of that. <laughs> um, and if you are familiar with Giger's work, again, you might be, if you don't know me and my sense of humor and you don't know Giger, you might be offended or at least put off or just think I'm a freak, but there's actually reasons behind these choices that are not just me indulging for personal reasons. I was doing my job. I was being professional. Um, it's basically a giant face hugger, and I thought that that was appropriate. And the way it was animated in the final film, you kind of get that sense as it's on top of him. And yes, it is supposed to look like an, a, a sexual act that is occurring on top of the engineer. If you go back to the original film again, it's chock full of all sorts of um, crazy things. The thing that's sticking out there, I thought to myself, what is it that's off-putting to kind of everyone? Now, everyone who's had a dog, and you've pet the dog, and he's showing a little lipstick, just poking out there, I thought, that would be kind of cool. It's just right there, you know? It's got a little bit of a doggy boner, and it, it's those unconscious things that I thought that would be kind of interesting to do, is that when his creature's about to get the engineer and it's coming at the camera, imagine a dog with you know, just a little bit of detail uh, wanting to jump on your lap. It's like, no, 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 get off me. And that was the idea, with the teeth, et cetera, et cetera. And I looked for other things that would be also disturbing, and I knew that I was gonna get a whole lot of harassment from various people, but I want to point something out. I'm almost afraid to touch it, but this stuff here, <clears throat> I did that intentionally. I wanted it to look as giger as you could possibly imagine. And for those of you that are familiar with the human body or animal physiology in general, I think you might know what that is. And you would be completely wrong because what it is is a freshwater snail mouth. That's its lips, that's what it looks like before the labial fold, which is what it's called also in a snail, opens up and the radula comes out. It's absolutely horrifying. So my point is, is that not everything has to be, you buy a penthouse or something, okay, what can I put in my creature? There's plenty of stuff in nature by virtue of utility that will look like things that we choose to interpret and um, anthropomorphize. So it's not always about using a sexual metaphor, it's about using the appropriate utility metaphor um, to generate an aesthetic and a provocative primal fear. There's our dog. So you get the idea. Uh, the deliverables, ZBrush model, um, I would show this to Ridley, I'd show it to Weta, they would take the model. They of course made this a digital character, but it was also a full-size practical puppet, briefly. They didn't end up using it, um, except for establishing lighting and so on, and probably some other things, but the, the crew built this full-size. It was incredible. That sucker's big. And again, just so you know, I know, for, again, those of you that don't know me, I apologize, but I'm, I'm talking about these things because I also want you to realize that I do it out of passion for design. So I used the reference of a hedgehog's penis, which is marvelous. <laughs> I re it's incredible, it really is. Uh, and Shamu's penis, which clearly is marvelous, it's huge. But 
I, I, when I work, I sit down and I think about the utility of the creature. I think about the utility within the context of the narrative. And that's when I begin my research to figure out what's the appropriate um, reference point, what's the appropriate metaphor, what's the appropriate mechanism. So it doesn't just come from, this is gonna be cool. It comes from a real heartfelt place of let's be as honest and as true to biology, um, to biomechanics as we possibly can. So have I justified my, myself enough? Okay, so that's Prometheus. How are you feeling, Paul, about me digging into your time? Okay. I don't want to take up too much. Are you guys okay if I run a bit long? Because uh, I'd love to show you some of the kind of the nuts and bolts behind it. <laughs> the hard surface modeling. Uh, these are some quick tests that we did. This has all happened at one time in terms of showing Ridley the design. So we moved quick. Alex Alvarez, um, Danny Volpe, and Artemis all helped with this particular animation to show it in the context of the established hall that it might be in, plus the way Ridley wanted to shoot it with regards to lighting. So very crunchy, very black and white. Ta-da, and there she is, or he. I guess it's a hermaphrodite. So when Ridley saw these, he, you know, my challenge all along was, how do I take an octopus thing and make it walk on its octopus legs and not have it look completely daft or comical? Um, you ever see that animation? I think it's called Octopod. It's a beautiful Pixar-esque thing about these two um, octopus that are being chased by, they left the sushi restaurant and they're in Greece. Oh, it's amazing. As amazing as it was, I was concerned that that's what we'd end up with in terms of the feel of it. And Weta took a stab at the animation, which I'm gonna to jump to. These are just simple turntables. It's glorious what they do, but it felt almost like, the who, the who, coming to get you. But brilliant animation as it goes. So, after all of that, um, it was quickly fired off and approved. Weta did their thing, and whether you liked the movie or not, uh, it was neither here nor there. It was, um, it was well executed visually. Oblivion, whole different thing. Now we're talking hard surface stuff. Joe Kaczynski, who did Tron, so I work with Joe on Tron. So I want you to see some of the stuff from Oblivion because it's not that dissimilar to how I worked on Tron. We had to do a special suit for Tom Cruise that was going to be very much like the Tron suit in terms of our fabrication techniques that we had developed, which is basically a creature rubber suit, except the only difference is it's not textures and hides. It's, um, it's a very controlled, man-made surface. So these were super quick studies based on some sketches I had done earlier on. We knew that the script called for a white suit, off-white slightly, and we knew that it had to be in the future. It had to be very utilitarian in a lot of ways. He's a repairman. How many of you saw Oblivion? Okay, so you know the drill. Um, so I started developing these graphic elements coupled with the, the utility of costume making because this costume has to work. Tom has to be able to do certain things. There's stunts that have to happen in the suit. So it's, it's a lot trickier than you think when the suit has to work. Then at one point, at the very, very beginning, before we had Tom Cruise cast, it was actually Brad Pitt. So um, you'll see one of the images. These are just material tests. Um, I did not do the bubble ship. That was Daniel Simon, amazing designer, who also worked on Tron. Um, it was Joe Kaczynski's idea, the bubble ship, and Daniel made it a work of art, and the fabricators who built it, it's one of the most unbelievable props. So I took his early, early model, put it onto a bogus platform where the ship would take off from, incorporated my design of the suit with it just to see the two in the same context, in the same world. 
And um, it felt like both Daniel and I were developing the same form language. So he would, he would look at what I was doing a little bit, I would look at what he was doing a lot of it, and allow myself to be inspired by the form language, the graphic language, et cetera, et cetera, some of the detailing. The process of this um, is a different suit. This is something done for a different project called, well, I'm not gonna tell you just in case. Anyway, it's called something, that's for sure has a name, and they needed a design super quick. So I took my basic, decent, physical guy, and I started sculpting on the surface in the same way that I had done on Tron and Oblivion, which is, this is before all the groovy new tools happened in ZBrush, um, with flatten, trimming surface. This is all just like, <laughs> I'm pounding, virtual clay, trying to get it to submit to my desires. And all that I'm doing here is playing around with variations on a theme of form language, because that's what this is about. My education, if you don't know, is industrial design at the Art Center College in Pasadena. So I'm very much about the utility of something, form follows function, and my f form propensity is that of an automotive designer. So I'm applying that kind of methodology to costume. And then once I get a look that I think is gonna be appropriate, strike a pose, export that into Modo, and I'll start to run some render passes of some very simple materials. So all I did was I took those various render layers into Photoshop, stacked them on top of one another, created a mask for each one so that now the image became invisible. And then when I drew on the surface, I'm drawing essentially with a fully rendered black rubber or I'm drawing with a fully rendered red metallic, and it quickly allowed me opportunities to explore material breakup, graphic design, also realize we're designing Ultraman and we can't have that, just by virtue of color and graphics. This design does not function as a physical suit that the actor had to wear, which is one of the reasons I could do it so quickly. It was gonna be a full digital effect, so armpits, all that stuff could be rubber and stretch. The metal hard surfaces, again, could be rubber and stretch. We didn't have to make it work, thank God. And once the client basically approved the design, which uh, happened very quickly because they had no opportunity to play with this, uh, I then br brought it back into Modo and did some more elaborate renders and then the occasional Photoshop touch-up adding some graphics. So this is what they used in their pitch. And I was astonished as well. I mean, I, I must say there are a few times where I'm pleased with what I do, uh, particularly with very little time, but I sat back and thought, this process is amazing. You know, this is ZBrush meets Modo for the most part. And it's also a combination of being decisive about your designs, and having a, enough experience with manufacturing techniques so that the choices that you make, you can make with confidence that they have the potential that they would work and therefore they will convey visually that it looks like it is a functional outfit, even though this is totally bogus. So I'm gonna kind of buzz through this Tron. Happening. You've seen it. So. <laughs> We don't need to spend our time with the trailer. Tron, I basically did what you just saw, but I'm gonna cut to some of the specifics. The Blackguard helmet and the Blackguard sculpt um, that I did, the Blackguard sculpt is somewhere, and then the Blackguard helmet is out in the hallway. The Blackguard originally was this, and we needed to do something that was a bit more contemporary versus lacrosse gear and hockey equipment which I was happy to be a part of. But there were, fundamentally, they were black, that's what Joe wanted, and they had to feel menacing, and they had to have this respirator kind of aesthetic. And it was pretty early on that I realized there's no point in me doing drawings, because I had already done that with the Flynn character, and I felt, let's just go straight into ZBrush, and let's sculpt this sucker out. And from there, um, I got Ironhead involved, because I, I worked with them in the past, I knew their skill set, they're phenomenal. They were kind of, for me, the only group that I wanted to work with on this, because I had been charged by the producers, Neville, you've done helmets for real, and I have, worked for Nike and all sorts of helmet companies making real 
products so I know how, how much fit, how protective they need to be, and how to prototype them to look like real products as opposed to a movie prop. So I knew that Ironhead, Jose Fernandez, um, could make the ultimate prop. And they brought in Eddie Yang, who is an incredible everything, and he broke down the ZBrush model into its components, reworked them so that they had the appropriate lips and, um, and fit and finish. And from there, that was the end resulting model that was grown, CNC cut. Um, it was a variety of many, many different processes. And this is the end result. Now, we had no time for this not to work out. Every single thing, when we printed it, or grew it, or molded it and cast it, it had to work that time. There was just no time to go, ah, it didn't work out, so let's do it again. Nope, there's no money, there's no time. So when we printed these, we had to make damn sure that they fit our actors. So we've got a head scan of a stunt guy, we got a head scan of Olivia Wilde, we got head scans of everyone, and body scans as well. And we had to make sure that this stuff fit in ZBrush. And then when we brought it out of ZBrush into whatever program was going to print it, uh, that it retained that exact scale. Not one time were we wrong. And that's not because we were good. <laughs> that's because there was an angel on our shoulder during this whole process. Now, we knew enough to make good judgment calls, but um, it was kind of incredible. So all of this is uh, nylon. Uh, it's printed, I, I'm so sorry, I'm at a convention, I should be able to tell you the exact machine and the exact process. I was not um, there for this. Is Ironhead presenting at the end of the day, you said? No, just Adam from Ironhead. Okay, he'll, he'll probably bring it up and... He's doing a helmet, actually. Great. Uh, once we have the prototypes that are printed, there's a lot of hand finishing. Um, the glass work was really critical, that's our end resulting black guard. And on this particular costume, we CNC cut the torso, the legs, we grew the feet, we grew the little hockey pucks on his uh, thighs, the helmet, multiple different parts. And as you saw out there, we printed it out as a reference piece for the sculptors to have something to refine the full size cut prototype. The components. You forget how much design work there is in these suits. I'd get to the feet and I'd realize, oh, I'm doing another Nike shoe. And I had, you know, 10 characters, 10 different shoes to do. It was oh, such a hard project. I almost died. I had to go to the hospital because I almost died. It was so stressful. Uh, Phil Saunders, amazing concept designer, took some of the uh, images of the ZBrush model incorporated him, them rather, into his painting of the end of line club. That's the parachute, which was a digital concept. So I did this in After Effects. I bought After Effects and thought, I should be able to show how this works. So Joe gets the idea that it's this thing that folds up uh, and goes into its little pack. And um, it, it was cool, except for the fact that it looks like a ceiling fan in this. <laughs> Somebody pointed out, so every time I see it, I was like, oh, it's a wicker ceiling fan. Crap. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Nope. Um, so we would also do various yeah, tests these the old ones are not the deep ones. with Ironhead, uh, uh, fit and finish, gotcha. making gotcha. sure that the actor has the ability gotcha. to, in this case, the stunt Can you do person, the, same extreme the ability to move their head. That hose, is it bending properly, which it is Just not at this point? Excuse me. Um, we're also testing out the costume. This is great, you know, because I imagine myself in a costume thinking, okay, yeah, I think this is gonna work, no problem. And then this guy comes in, and it's like, oh, we got a problem. I didn't anticipate a man can do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> redesign those regions all over again. Um, this is the end of Lion Club, and every now and then you get thrown a bone. The bone in this case is, that's me, right there. That's Daniel Simon, the vehicle designer. And then David Levy is right there. David Levy was kind of the environmental visionary of the film. So we went up to Canada 
And Joe Kaczynski thought it'd be really funny if he just squoze us into a scene. It was a nightmare. We were there for a week and we're acting as background extras. I tell you, man, this movie almost killed me. Kevin Flynn, looking for the appropriate aesthetic of Kevin Flynn, we actually grew a lot of different components that came out of ZBrush. Boot bits, uh, we would do fit tests with the dude and make sure that he's, as a performer, as a, as a character, feels like he's getting what he needs. It's an important thing to collaborate with your actor in these specialty costumes, because they have to they have to do their job as well. You can't just say, here's your costume, and they're like, oh, I can't move. So, very nice guy, by the way. Uh, Clue, which is the younger version of Jeff Bridges. We had to do a costume for him, brand new, ran out of money, so we ended up doing Blackguard Modified as um, his particular costume. But this helmet, which again is gonna be accredited to two things. One, super fast sculpting in ZBrush, and two, growing it and figuring out a manufacturing technique that's gonna work for real. Because Joe Kaczynski specifically wanted this helmet to be completely opaque black. So, what that meant was that okay, our actor underneath can't see diddly. Look, completely okay. Stop. So how is he going to uh, perform? Again. Well, what they came up with, Ironhead, was this heads-up display system inside of the helmet. So that's not a scene from uh, X-Men. So he's got this heads-up display that he's wearing, and at the very top, here, in that specifically designed triangle as a piece of smoked black acrylic, almost like a two-way mirror, that has a camera up there for him to see out of. And there's fans inside that are cooling him. We've got um, speakers so that you can talk to the actor. There's remote systems off camera so you can turn it on and off so you don't wear out the batteries. And this stuff was high tech. Sam Flynn, uh, what a painful, painful, painful journey to figure it out because his costume was the most important. We're inventing new ways of using all the techniques that are available in specialty costume and um, also the most contemporary way to light a costume because Joe Kaczynski and the producers felt that it was vital that this costume be practically lit, meaning it actually lit up as opposed to what they did 30 years prior where they used visual effects. We took my ZBrush model, Eddie Yang proportioned it based on shrink, anticipated shrink of the actual foam wetsuit, and we grew CNC cut rigid foam, and from there hand worked it and then started to injection mold foam into these molds that were made by Quantum Effects. And we did, in this case we had no chance to go back and forth, but we had the chance to do fittings and refine the fitting of the costume and test out the lighting, et cetera, et cetera. And there are so many stories about how poorly this was all going for so long until we finally, in the last minute, I think, figured it out. That's him doing his Dick Van Dyke hug, for any of you that know. Just curious, how many got that reference? Remember Dick Van Dyke was? You're pathetic, John. Yeah. <laughs> you too. <laughs> uh, so the helmets were our piece de resistance because I knew that that needed to look like not a film prop, but rather an injection molded piece of consumer high-end product, like a hockey visor. And that meant that these little visors, as I was doing some tests with <clears throat> within Moto, they had to have the optical quality of a proper product and have the varying wall thicknesses that you would have for structural integrity in a protective visor like a hockey helmet, which meant that it was gonna be incredibly difficult to produce. But I have experience having worked with Nike doing their hockey helmets that I knew the prototyping process that Iron had embraced. So again, we grow the helmet one time, it better fit him and it better look good on him. And it wasn't bad. And these are all the little bits and pieces. Uh, it sounds like Ironhead's gonna go over some of this in greater detail. Uh, these are renders from Moto, but they came out of ZBrush, just so you know. Cora, tricky, tricky, tricky costume because 
Hers we fabricated by hand, the costume, but the helmet, oh my. The helmet was a real concern because it had to fit super tight on Olivia. And there's the helmet. It had to be androgynous. And Joe Kaczynski said, it also has to look like the actress. I'm like, okay, I gotcha. All sorts of contradictions. Let me, let me see if I can reconcile that. So we sculpted it in clay, we being quantum, and did some tests. This is the only one to actually, we did have some back and forth because we're trying to deal with a fit um, on her that was really critical to make her look sexy, et cetera. But the helmets were where I was focused on at this point. We established the tone, but the helmet was just such a, a perfect representation of ZBrush to print. Because we took this, we printed it out, and hand worked all the surfaces and had no wiggle room whatsoever. It had to be super tight. It had to fit on her head with hair and she had to be comfortable. And the first fitting, it worked, which meant that we succeeded. Rinsler, Eddie, Ed, Nativity Ed did a sketch that set the tone. I then took the ball from there and started to establish the very, very, very first image I did for the project, which we're still trying to sell Tron to Disney at this point. So that was one of the pitch pieces changed considerably, uh, and that's the final design. We ran out of money and time to do the digital process, so we ended up sculpting this one in clay. Um, David Grasso here, an amazing sculptor, doing it all old school, molds, fiberglass, hand sanding, Rob Freitas, an amazing mold maker, taking this thing to a high level of finish and molding it in a way that is just unbelievable. If you know anything about molding, Rob Freitas is a god. And then we do our tests with our, uh, he's a parkour genius, Anise is his name. And Anise, we're testing out the costume on him for the first time. And I just love the sound. I, uh, that with I'm all curious lighting. if he's able to actually yeah, move and function. <laughs> so I think it is here. I was like, okay, let's have you, just do some kind of like poses. Let's see what you got to see if this works out. So this okay. is what he chooses to do as a test. <laughs> I think that was a $5,000 test. <laughs> Piece that shot off his head had to be re redone. But yeah, be careful when you say to a stunt person, yeah, just do some moves real quick. <laughs> uh, fabrication process, a lot of old school but from the standpoint of how we're using this technology today of doing a sculpt digitally, however you choose to do it, printing it out, CNC cutting it, whatever the process is of growing, of prototyping, everything on Tron, which is kind of amazing, was done using technology that in the original film was fantasy. Let's get Jeff Bridges into the computer by scanning him with a laser. Now we did that. And then let's manufacture and invent things using the computer. And then let's grow them using the computer and laser sintering and all this stuff. So we're using all the technologies to make these costumes um, that were based on science fiction some years ago. It was kind of an interesting epiphany. All the way to the point of set pieces with our sirens who are in the wall there, we would take the concept art and then start to generate those basic wall motifs which were kind of half digital, half practical. And then from there, start to stick our actress into them just to kind of see what that would be as an actual wall piece. I think I might just end it there because otherwise I'm just gonna consume all of your presentation and that's not cool. So, uh, yeah, I've gone over by half hour. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if I've offended any of you, my apologies and all sincerity, but that is the job not to offend you, but some of the stuff I do can be offensive. So thank you very, very much for your time. <laughs>